Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. The title of our study is Wisdom on Marriage, Children, and Wealth. In a world where marriages face increasing pressures, the timeless words of Jesus offer profound insight and wisdom in the perspectives that we need. It reminds me of a story I heard once in a Sunday school class. Uh, the teacher asked, what does the Bible say about marriage to the little kids? One little boy innocently raised his hand and responded with, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. <laughs> Sometimes people <laughs> rush into marriage, and, uh, and we'll take a look at that and uh, God's intent for us to consider uh, the weight of entering into that holy covenant. Um, and so as we get into Matthew 19, we'll discover Jesus also teaches us how to stay faithful in marriage, uh, that we're called to embrace children and never hinder them from coming to the Lord. And so we'll also encounter at the end of our time together a rich young ruler who appeared to have it all, but there was something he was missing, and he lacked salvation through faith. So let's uh, dive in. We'll explore these truths together. We'll take a look at the first 12 verses here in Matthew 19 and see Jesus expound and teach upon marriage and divorce. And so picking up here in Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Verse 7. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, All cannot accept the same, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept him, let him accept it. We'll pause there. Now, we enter into this period of time. This is after Jesus just concluded uh, his teachings on the power of forgiveness and healing people and, and, and encouraging people to forgive one another. And we see that in the midst of this, Jesus leaves Galilee, accompanied by large crowds of people, uh, continuing to follow him. And he ministers to those who are seeking healing, and he heals them demonstrating both his compassion for them, but also his divine authority as God. However, we see a new group of people approach, these religious leaders. And, and we see they're not coming to Jesus for healing, but they're aiming to trap him with a divisive question designed to discredit him or try and accuse him of some sort of heresy. And so they ask Jesus about the uh, legal part of divorce, and, and there are differing interpretations of the rabbis of the day, the Jewish scholars, and so Rabbi Shemel held that adultery was the sole grounds for divorce. Rabbi Halil allowed broader reasonings, and he taught his students that if the wife burnt the bread or she had a bad temper, for any one of those reasons, that was enough for you to file for divorce. And so all of this is in the background as they're asking just for any reason, no. 
And so Jesus confronts them saying, have you not read? And I love that he asked this question. Oftentimes Jesus, when he's asked a question, will ask a question in return. And you got to remember, these are the Jewish scholars of the day. They've read the Old Testament many times. And so Jesus asks them, have you not read? It's kind of a question to get them to really think, well, we read it, but did we really understand what it was saying? And so he points them back to Genesis, affirming God's original design and intent for marriage. One biological man, one biological woman, united as one flesh for life till death do you part. That's God's design. And this is the the union that is sacred and ordained by God himself. Despite the cultural pressures today to try and redefine gender or marriage, um, Jesus asserts that uh, humanity cannot alter God's design. Right? We didn't create gender. We didn't create marriage or family. Those are God's design. God created those things. And so we need to recognize that. And that we see the Pharisees question, well, why did Moses allow divorce if God intended marriage to be till death do us part? And so then Jesus clarifies, well, Moses permitted this divorce due to the human heart that was just hard and prideful and selfish. And so it wasn't a divine command. And he states that marital unfaithfulness is the only acceptable grounds for divorce. Now, I, I need to make mention of this, um, please know that any sin can be forgiven in Jesus Christ. And many times I've done counseling with people and find out uh, there's there's situations and and they're asking, well, what what about in my situation? I find most often than not that divorce happened before they came to Christ, right? And if we're honest, we all sinned a lot before we came to Christ. But once you come to Christ, you're trying to follow him. You're trying to live a life that pleases and glorifies him. And so I want to make mention that this is not the unforgivable sin. God can forgive. God can heal. God can restore. God can bless a new marriage. And I also need to make mention on a pastoral note that we need to be uh, aware of the reality of abuse, right? There's physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, and and if that is in the, the situation in the home, I always encourage uh, the person who is the victim to separate. Remove yourself from that situation. Seek uh, legal help if you can from law enforcement. Seek uh, some biblical counseling. And, and hopefully the goal is restoration, reconciliation, if possible. Right? And if that doesn't happen, then eventually... Uh, divorce can happen. Other times I've seen couples just stay separated for many, many years. And, and unfortunately, there's not reconciliation. But that's what God has, has told us, right? And so uh, we want to make sure that we're doing what we can to help keep people safe and, and seek that reconciliation if possible. Now, we see when the disciples hear this, they express concern over the strictness of Jesus' teaching on divorce and And Jesus explains to them, not everyone can accept this, but to those who can, they should. And then we see he speaks about different types of eunuchs. That's not a phrase we commonly use today. Uh, This is a a person who would be a servant or a slave of a king. Um, And he breaks down those different types of them, illustrating that celibacy is a valid choice for those who are called to serve in the kingdom of heaven. As I was thinking about that, it reminds me today that our culture is heading in the wrong direction. Society encourages what we would call trial relationships or cohabitation. And yet the breakdown of of these relationships uh, scar people for life, right? And most often they end in failed marriages. God's intention for marriage is to be steadfast, to be faithful, to be a solid foundation in the home for children providing children with a secure and nurturing environment. And so if you're a young person here today, I would encourage you uh, to make sure you're seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Don't rush into marriage. Make sure uh, that the other person loves Jesus just as much as you or even more than you. That you go to their house and 
you take a look at their Bible, it's not sitting on the shelf collecting dust, right? That they're actually in the, the Word of God, and that they're going to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. And so I, I try and encourage young people, rather than focus on trying to find that right person, focus on trying to be the right person in Christ Jesus. Focus on your relationship with the Lord, and, and, and let that be the primary focus that God has for you. And also know that marriage requires active participation. There's, there's no cruise control uh, in marriage. Right? It's like a dance where two people become one as, as God is guiding the harmony of these two people, learning how to do life together and, and dancing to God's music and purpose. And so it's a reminder to us men were called to love our wives sacrificially right, in the sacred bond of marriage, reflecting Christ's love in the home, a representation of the church. And, and dads, your role is invaluable. You're irreplaceable in the home, and you ensure a strong foundation for your family. So stay steadfast in your faith. Honor the sacred bond of marriage that God has, has given us. And, and remember that it's a testimony of God's design. It enriches uh, your family, it enriches the church, it enriches every community. Uh, strong, healthy families are the backbone and the strength of any community, of any nation. And so we want to continue to encourage families to stay healthy and stay strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we'll see next some children are brought to Jesus. We'll see the disciples have the wrong response. And we'll see Jesus corrects them and offers the right response. And we'll see that here in verse 13 through verse 15 as Jesus blesses the little children. It says here in verse 13, Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Now, I love this, this little section. There's so much here uh, in the short passage uh, before us. We see Jesus' heart for uh, children, right? Surrounded by these crowds pressing in on him. We, we see he's approached by some parents, uh, bringing their children to him, seeking a blessing and favor from Jesus Christ. The disciple is probably thinking, well, Jesus is too busy, right? He doesn't have time for this. He's on a mission. And so they begin to, to tell the parents, no, 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 you can't bring your children. All right, our rabbi is too busy. He's got things to do. He doesn't have time for this. And so they're trying to send the children away and, and kind of, in essence, rebuking the parents, right? You know, no, Jesus doesn't need to see you guys. And yet we see Jesus says, time out, hold on, <laughs> begins to rebuke his disciples. No, 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 don't forbid them. Don't hinder them. Let the little ones come to me. And we see that he welcomes the children, affirms that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like them, right, childlike. And I think it's fitting that Jesus, after teaching about marriage, begins to bless the children, highlighting the significance, the joyful heritage of married couples, right? Children are a heritage from the womb, a blessing from the Lord and so we see Jesus emphasize the importance of children, reiterating that kingdom of heaven is meant for those who approach God with a childlike faith. And we've looked at this before. It's coming to him with a trust, coming to him with a dependence, a reliance uh, that a child has upon their parents, right, to take good care of them. We need to have that same mindset of trusting the Lord to take good care of us. And he does. And so we see taking the children in his arms, Jesus blesses them thus demonstrating his love, his care, his compassion for them. And I need to also make mention of this because some people have tried to use this text for other things, uh, but this text is not uh, a declaration of what we would say water baptism for children. Uh, this text is not used for edifying, the, uh, uh, trying to say that this is an example of salvation for little ones through some sort of laying on of the hands. No, what we see here is this is an act of God's tender love and care for children, 
right? And we need to realize that children still in their formative years uh, have not yet reached the age of accountability. They're assured by God's grace and mercy. And so the closest thing we would have today, I would say, uh, within the church would be what we would call a baby dedication, right? where we put our hands on the child and, and we bless the child. We want to see the child grow and healthy and strong. And at the same time, we're praying for the parents. That God would give them wisdom, right? How do you, how do you take care of this little bundle of joy? Uh, how do you deal with the stresses of life as you're nurturing and raising this little one and the nurture and admonition of the Lord? And then it also allows us as the church family to come alongside them and help them when we can and, and to be accountable to one another, right, as a church family. And so um, that's what we would practice is, is the, clo- the closest thing I can think to this example and, and affirming the privilege of bringing children to Jesus and blessing uh, them and, and the parents. And so we see this blessing of Jesus underscores his message that everyone is valued in the kingdom of heaven. Those with a childlike faith. And also reminds us that humility is necessary. Right? God will not allow you uh, to, to be a part of his kingdom if you're prideful, if you're selfish, if you're thinking about your, what you can bring to the table. Humility is essential in embracing our relationship with God. Childlike faith, sincere and trusting in the Lord. However, the opposite of that is pride, and pride blinds us, right? It blinds us to our need for God, and there's a stark contrast we'll take a look at next. Uh, it's illustrating this following example of uh, this rich young ruler, and we'll see Jesus give us some counsel Uh, to this man next, and we'll take a look at that here in verse 16 through verse 30. He says here in verse 16, Now, behold, one came to him, uh, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. You shall honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, As sure they say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, As surely I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. We see in this last section, this rich young man comes to Jesus, addressing him as good, seeking guidance on obtaining eternal life. And we see Jesus redirects his focus, emphasizing there's only one that is good, and that's God implying his authority and the importance of really heeding his words because Jesus is God. We see Jesus challenges this man to to keep the commandments if he wants to have eternal life. 
Now, I need to make mention here, you can't keep the commandments. We've all fallen short of the grace of God. What Jesus is doing here, he's challenging us, God, because he's a moralist. He thinks he's perfect, right? I have never sinned. I keep the commandments. And, and he begins to list them off, and, and we see he says he's without sin, keeping uh, the, the second set of the commandments. So in the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments are dealing with our relationship with God. They're, they're the vertical commandments, the relationship. The last six are horizontal relationship, dealing with us and with one another, how we interact with each other, right? Again, Jesus summed this up, to love God, right, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first four of the commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's dealing with the second set, the, six, the other six commandments. And so we see he's coming and saying, well, I've kept that second set. I've been very kind and, and generous to people, and, and I've always honored my parents, which, of course, we know is not true. <laughs> and so he says, what more do I need? What, what, else, what am I lacking? What else can I do to obtain salvation? Again, he, he's coming to Jesus with a works-based mindset, right? A works-based righteousness that I can do something then to get eternal life. And, and that, it's just, it's, it's not possible, right? It's, it's not obtainable. And yet, sadly, there are many cults and false religious groups out there today that will teach that you can do works uh, to enter into heaven or to secure your salvation, and you'll see people, they'll come, usually dress nicely. They'll come knock on your door. Uh, we've got a book for you. We've got a magazine for you. We want to tell you how you can become right, part of the 144,000 or um, you know, be with our elect group. And, um, and sadly, they're, they're mistaken. <laughs> right? God's not looking for us to do works. Uh, he's looking for us to have faith in him. The works come later out of a heart of of gratitude, a heart of response to his love, right? And so it, the, the faith is the roots in Christ Jesus. The works are a fruit from that relationship. And so they've kind of got the, the thing backwards, right? Trying to, to obtain that salvation. And so recognizing this man's prideful heart, Jesus exposes his attachment to wealth as an idol, highlighting his reliance upon this, again, works-based righteousness, rather than having a genuine surrender to God. Again, he's ignoring the first four of the commandments that deals with our vertical relationship with God Almighty. So Jesus instructs the man, sell all your possessions and give the, all the proceeds to the poor. And then come follow me and you'll have perfection. What does the man do? Does he do that? No. We see the man's deeply attached to his wealth. He leaves sorrowful. The word there is bitterful. He's unable to part with his riches. It reminds me, Jesus had, has said in the Gospel of Matthew already, that you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve mammon or you can't serve God and money. You'll love one or despise the other. And so we see that this man is obsessed with his riches and more riches and so we, he encounters this, this challenge from Jesus Christ. And I think at the same time, this uh, should put a damper on people's mindset that somehow having a lot of wealth or prosperity is a sign of, of divine um, blessing from the Lord. There are a lot of false prosperity teachers out there that say that if you have all these material things, it's a sign of, of God's divine favor upon your life. And I'm like, have you not read the book of Acts? Have you not read the Gospels? I mean, Paul didn't have much. He was shipwrecked and beaten. And uh, I mean, on the island of Malta, a snake bit him and he threw it off. And uh, I mean, these, these people didn't have much. And, and what's also interesting here is you see Jesus didn't say, sell all you have and give me the proceeds. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, give it away. And, and the sad part is prosperity teachers will say, sell all you have and give it to me. Give it to my ministry. Jesus never did that, right? Je in fact, God doesn't need our money. Yeah, he can use it, right, in his kingdom. But what he really wants, he wants our heart. If he can get a hold of our heart, then everything else is his, as it should be. And so we see here that, that uh, Jesus begins to tell his disciples it's exceedingly difficult 
for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he uses this metaphor, or this visual illustration of a camel passing through the eye of a needle to illustrate this challenge. Now, there are some different interpretations of what this means. Some people say this suggests a narrow gate in the city walls in Jerusalem. Um, I, I have looked for archaeological evidence. I haven't seen that. Um, I've been to Israel. I asked them when we were there. They said there's nothing like that here. Um, I've looked in the uh, archaeological study Bible. And it has a good note on, on this. Um, and, and it talks about um, that uh, this is, would be not a, a physical place, that this is a literal sense that Jesus is using a hyperbole statement uh, to make it very clear that this is something impossible. Now, maybe possible if you take a camel and you grind them up very thin, right, and then you maybe put them through the eye of a needle, uh, but he's not going to stay a, a camel that's alive, right? And so that's the picture here. This is, that's why they have to say, oh, this is impossible. How, how can this happen? Right. If it was a physical place that people could perform, well, then it would be possible. This is something impossible. And so we see that Jesus is, is, is reiterating that. This is an impossible act. And, and this offers an obstacle. Right? How do we then obtain eternal life on our own? We, we can't. I also need to make mention that wealth is not evil. It's not bad. Uh, but if you're over-focused upon it, it can lead towards a life of idolatry, a, a focus on your riches rather than upon the Lord. And it can lead to self-sufficiency and distract from a dependence upon God. Many people who are rich think, well, I don't need God. I have everything I need. And sadly, it's not till the end of the life they realize they had their trust misplaced in their riches, Right? Our real treasure shouldn't be in earthly things. Our real treasure should be in heavenly things. Our real treasure is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus clarifies salvation is impossible through human efforts or works. Eternal life is a gift from God. Right? Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that. It, it's through our faith by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not of works lest anyone should boast. It is a gift from the Lord. And so we see that it's impossible to save yourself. And then we see Peter begins to ask about the disciples' reward, right? Jesus assures them positions of authority in his kingdom, their future roles, and judging the 12 tribes of Israel someday. But then Jesus also promises abundant blessings in heaven to all who forsake earthly comforts for his sake, right? That, that are, are seeking his kingdom, and then Jesus concludes with this profound statement that many who are esteemed on first on earth, well, when they get to heaven, um, they're kind of last in the kingdom there. And those who are considered the, the least, the last here on earth, well, they're going to be highly esteemed someday there. And so we see this underscores God's reversal of earthly values in his kingdom. Man so often has a perspective of power and prestige and wealth and riches and title and positions and, and their own status. And, and again, Jesus said he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven are going to be those with childlike faith who are humble servants of the Lord. And, and I can't wait to, to someday meet all these faithful men and women who have prayed and, and been a blessing, a part of the kingdom. And, and I'm sure many of them, they didn't do uh, what we would say is big major things for the kingdom of God. Right? They weren't a Billy Graham. Right? They weren't a Mother Teresa. But yet, they were faithful. They prayed, they read, they shared the love of Christ with those around them. Those are the ones that I think are going to be highlighted in heaven because the others got their, got their earthly reward here. It also reminds me, the gospel was initially offered to the Jewish people. Later on, it would go to the Gentiles. And God's grace would continue to, to spread against the least, the, the last, and the lost. And, and that's God's plan for salvation. Right? It would start in Jerusalem and begin to go around the world and reach every single culture and nation and hopefully every single person. Now, we also see that this is kind of separate with a chapter break. 
Uh, and I need to make mention of that because Jesus will continue to explain this idea of the, the first and the last uh, with the parable in the next chapter. Although it is sometimes fun to use this verse, especially it seems like, at least in my family, when we're a long line for food, sometimes we'll say, hey, you remember the first shall be last, the last shall be first. But we'll see next week when we get in the next chapter. That's, the context doesn't deal with that. There's some other things taking place here um, about being uh, signif- significant in God's kingdom, right? The value that he has. So in closing, what we've seen is Jesus reaffirms God's original intent for marriage, his design, his purpose. Again, it's one man, one woman for life. And I hate to say it this way, but one biological woman, one biological man, united in marriage for life. Again, our culture is trying to redefine things, head to the wrong direction. God says that he's the one who created it, right? And since he's the author of it, we want to honor his design. And we see that marriage is a sacred union rooted in love and fidelity between a man and a woman. And again, despite the challenges of our culture, Jesus calls us to uphold the sanctity of marriage and honor the commitment and that covenant between spouses. We also see Jesus emphasize profound value upon children and God's kingdom. We should not hinder children from coming to him, but in fact, we should encourage it. He urges us to embrace a childlike faith as well wholeheartedly trusting the Lord for his love and his provision in our lives. And then we see this rich young ruler, which should remind us that we need to remember eternal life is not earned through our attempts. It's not attained through any works or deeds or good things that we can do. It is a gift from God. It is God's grace that he offers to us. And so as we reflect on this rich young ruler's journey, I hope that we learn that our treasure isn't in worldly things. Our treasure is found in surrendering our hearts to Jesus Christ and giving everything we have, including all of ourselves, to follow him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this chapter. We thank you for the profound truths here for us. We pray, God, that you would help us uh, to follow closely to Uh, stay near you. We pray, God, that you'd help us to continue to um, bless uh, the family unit that you've created. Help us, Lord, to continue to celebrate, uh, especially on Father's Day, the importance uh, of having a godly home. And, And Lord, that you would continue to lead us in a way that glorifies you. We thank you for the stability that you offer within the family unit. We thank you for the blessing that marriage is. We thank you for the heritage of having children and the joy they bring to our lives. Help us, Lord, to not hinder them from coming to you, but to encourage them to come to you, especially as we see the culture in this world trying to go after our children and other children. Help us, Lord, to do what we can to protect children and encourage them to grow in a relationship with you, planting those seeds and watering them the best that we can. And Father, we pray that we would not try to obtain salvation on anything that, that we could try and do on our part, through our works, through our deeds, through trying to be a nice person. Help us to realize, Lord, that none of that is going to offset our sin, the crime that we've committed against you. Help us to realize, Lord, that it's by your mercy, your free gift of salvation, your grace, that we need to humbly uh, bow before you and receive this free gift. Allow you to pardon us and then permit us into a relationship with you as you extend grace and forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that we would then celebrate and rejoice in seeing people find real treasure in you as we have. And Lord, we pray if there be anyone here today who has yet to surrender their life, we pray, God, that today would be their day of salvation. They would realize how much you love them, that you desire to forgive them, that you want to be their heavenly Father, to guide them, to walk with them, to provide for them and protect them. And if that's you this morning, you'd say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. 
I need to get right with God. I need to surrender my life to the Lord. If that's you and you're ready to make the decision, I want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and truly mean it in your heart. And based upon God's word, you'll become born again, born anew by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. God, I realize that I am a sinner, that my sin separates me from you. And God, I realize that you love me, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins, that he was buried and rose from the dead. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins, that you'd come into my heart and my life, that you would wash me clean, make me new. I surrender all of my life to you. Help me to follow you from this day forward and put your spirit within me that I may do your perfect will. I thank you for loving me, for forgiving me, for being my Savior and my Lord and my King. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you, and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus Christ, perhaps a rededication, coming home to him as a prodigal, I would love to, to chat with you after service, pray with you, give you some resources, give you a Bible if you don't have one.